Five. <clears throat> Hello, uh, I'd like to welcome, to welcome you to our Digital Futures Local Voices session on Bangladesh. Um, this is one of a series that we are setting up. The idea behind the Local Voices is that we parachute in or zoom in to local communities to find out some of the ideas and, and motivations that are um, informing the local architectural scene in that space. Um, it's a part of a series. Uh, next month, we will be going, first of all, to the Amazon and doing a very special session looking at the rainforest and the issues, the political and, and issues to do with the development of the rainforest. After that, we'll be going to China, and in February, we'll be going to, um, to Russia. The idea behind these local voices is to somehow to get rid of the opposition between center and periphery. It's periphery. In the past, it's always been London, New York, uh, Los Angeles, and so on. They've been the center of architectural culture. And what we want to do is to disrupt that, to not so much make the periphery the center, but to get rid of that hierarchy. Um, so this is part of a series of, the, of these, these sessions. Um, and I will be just sitting in the background here and uh, joining in um, uh, for the discussion later on. I'd like to hand over to our host uh, today, uh, Vasco. Vasco. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I just share. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation us in the digital future world. First, I'd like to give a small introduction from where we have come from. Then we will advance to our main presentation, Local Voices. After getting independence in 1947 from British Empire, we become part of the Pakistan and known as East Pakistan. But it didn't last long. Finally, Bangladesh became independence in 1971. It is located just above Himalayan range and few strong rivers coming down through Bangladesh and finally reach to the Bay of Bengal, which is a part of the Indian Ocean. If we zoom further, we would see the line of the rivers crisscrossing the whole land and making a lattice-like pattern. The 700 rivers accumulated silt for thousands of years and the silt created the largest delta of the world. If we zoom and zoom again, we would see everything is soft and fragile. It looks like Jackson Polo's action painting where we played with his dribbles. So it's totally organic. No distinct line for land and water. We cannot distinguish them. Sometimes we find the organic water channels and sometimes vice versa. This unique landscape has many mega mighty rivers. Occasionally they change their courses, erode the banks, and simultaneously it emerges a land. So constant play and erosion and emerges take place here. For this unique landscape, the settlement is impermanent, temporal, and pavilion type structures. And they are mostly submerged by the nature. If we talk about the geography, geographically as Bangladesh is in the line of the Tropic of Cancer, we have six seasons in a year. We have a hot, humid summer, then the rainy season. We always celebrate rain, even though it creates water clogging in the city life. After that, we have the harvesting season, then the dry winter and the colorful spring. Historically, as Bangladesh is in the line of the, uh, historically as, a, as all the permanent structures are made with brick, eighth century Buddhist monastery, old Hindu temples, historical mosque, colonial structures, all of them are made with brick and they are always guided by the topography. The water channel flows and carries the commerce and the commerce flows to the highland. And eventually the commerce encroached the whole highland and created the city. Now, if we talk about the city, Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, is a mega city. It is highly dense, having more than 16 million of people. The city life is chaotic, have formal and informal character, but still they are colorful, eventful, 
festive as well. And always passionate for celebrating all type of events and all the games. <clears throat> Key person that shaped our modern architecture were Marjul Islam and Louis Aika. Marjul Islam was a pioneer and the most influential modernist in Indian subcontinent. He had shown us a newer version of architecture through his work since 1950s, combined with modernism, regionalism, and cultural respect. An Estonian-born American architect, Lou Aikan, was invited to design our National Parliament building complex in 1960s. He gave us a timeless architecture. It's monumental with poetic enclosure. He built a masterpiece considering our land and water, climate and culture. It seems it stand with his enigma of silence and light with his dramatic spaces. His building has given us inspiration. What was has always been, what is has always been, what will be has always been. Such is the nature of beginning. Uh, I think it's enough for now. Uh, we can start our first presentation with Mirinath Abbasum. So uh, if we introduce Mirinath Abbasum for a minute, Mehna Tabasum is one of the most distinguished architects in Bangladesh as well as in international arena. She graduated from Bangladesh University and Engineering Technology in 1995 and was the founder partner of the Arvana from where she owned a prestigious national competition to design the Independence Monument of Bangladesh and the Liberation War Museum. After that, she founded her own office, Merina Tabasum Architects in 2005. She owned the Aga Khan Awards for Architecture in 2016. 16, for the design of Baitul Lof Mosque in Dhaka. She has been the director of academic program at Bengal Institute of Architecture, Landscape and Settlement since 2015. She was covered with an honorable doctorate from the Technical University of Munich in 2020. Uh, I think uh, we can start his, her presentation now. Inheriting Wetness is a research our office conducted last year, commissioned by Sharjah Architecture Triennial, focusing on the dynamic movement of the Ganges Delta. The location of our investigation was Haimchor, a small town in Chattapur Chat District in Chittagong Division. According to official documents, Hainchor covers an area of 174 square kilometers with a population of 120,000 and density of 650 per square kilometer. Located in the lower part of Meghna River that flushes onto the Bay of Bengal, this area is rich in fishing, predominantly the breeding ground of Hilsa a fish that is strongly intertwined in the cultural identity of Bengalis. What makes this location unique is the dynamic movement of the confluence of three major rivers, Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna, that flows into the Bay of Bengal. This movement causes the banks to erode and also new sand bed emerges in the riverbed. Satellite images of Haimchor in the last three decades show how the small town has been losing its land to the mighty force of the rivers. Here the red dot denotes the main bazaar of Haimchor. By the year 2008 the bazaar was washed away and in 2016 a new sandbed is emerging in the river near the location of the original bazaar. Two videos here show the paradoxical reality of the movement. One on the left shows the strong river current during the summer months and monsoon season, washing away settlements, livelihood and living of the inhabitants. Whereas on the right, you see new sand beds and accretions formed during the dry season. 
due to the weakening of the river current and tidal dominance. These new lands are known as chores in local term. I find Anuradha Mathur and Dilip Dakunha's take on wetness to be most appropriate for the Ganges Delta. The idea of separating land from water with a line and thus ushering the idea of permanence in an impermanent and rather dynamic landscape is not only flawed and impractical, it also contributed to the suffering of the people. Two thirds of Bangladesh is formed by the Ganges Delta, the largest delta in the world, by accumulation of alluvial soil brought in by the rivers Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna. The rivers carry large amount of soil, rich in minerals and nutrients, including fine particles from the sources at Glacier in the Himalayan range, contributing to the rich agriculture and aquaculture of the country. The entire delta is crisscrossed by a labyrinth of more than 700 rivers, lakes, ponds, water retention areas, floodplains, making it a very rich waterscape rather than landscape. During the devastating Assam earthquake in 1950, Brahmaputra changed its original course as is shown here in Reynolds map from 1776 and takes on the course of Jamuna and meets the Ganges. And together they form Padma and meets Meghna near Chatpur and then flowing into the Bay of Bengal. Their combined flow creates the mighty current during the summer months and monsoon season that the fragile delta is unable to withstand and thus erodes. The Ganges Delta is a tide dominated delta. During the dry season and in the winter months when the current is low, due to tide, water flows back into the system, into the eastern estuarian system, causing sediments to form in the riverbed thus giving rise to new land. Focusing on the Hangchor area, which is still under threat of erosion like many other small towns and villages, is filled with personal stories of loss and gain. Many people have lost their lands and homesteads, becoming landless and migrating to the cities for living. Those who could afford bought new land and moved their homesteads there. We traced many such families in their lifetime has moved three to four times. The entire village, including the bazaar, shifts location, recreating a new settlement, all the while with the hope that the land will reemerge for them to claim and occupy. The houses are adapted to flat back system to facilitate the movement. It takes two hours to dismantle the house to move to a safer location when the ground starts to show lines of crack. It takes about a week to recreate it in a new location. These mobile form of houses can be bought or ordered in a local market for the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, we bought three houses and shipped them to Sharjah, where we showcased all our research findings. We also showcased personal stories, such as village doctor Najul Islam, who inherited his grandfather's 60-year-old house that moved seven different locations. The entire area is dotted with such personal stories.
fishermen and boatmen are the first to know about the new land, which is locally known as Chor. Every time a new Chor appears, the word spreads around fast in the mainland. The alluvium of the delta is fertile ground. If a chore is not eroded for the first four years of its existence, it can then be used for either cultivation or settlement. These possibilities encourage landless families and river nomads, those who are locally called churua, to migrate to the new emerged land, and thus new ecology starts to take place. Nature silently steps in with tall grass that anchors the soil. Mudskipper fish are the first to appear, attracting the birds. Crabs and shellfish colonies emerge from the riverbed, while fishermen start to stake boundaries over the chore. Buffaloes are brought in for grazing. The chorua can also make living by taking care of the livestock. While nature takes its own course with the new land, the local inhabitants get busy with their documents to relocate the property to be claimed. Village elders who recall their homesteads by referencing trees and other features in the neighboring properties that were not washed away it's time for the bundle of land deeds to be taken out of the drawers. Through a couple of meetings with the local Amin, the visits and some visits to the resurfaced chore, ownership boundaries are settled based on the old survey drawings, which are locally known as the Moja map. According to Moja map, the official recognized document, the area marked in orange is Haimchor. The history of Moja map or cadastral subdivision goes back to Sultanate period, but the written documentation of land ownership was commenced in 1888 following the Bengal Tenancy Act to facilitate revenue collection for the British Empire. The survey was completed in 1940 and revised only twice after that. Today, the Moja map are still the only land ownership documents that the Land Department of Bangladesh acknowledges as official. Under the British Empire, marshlands began to be consolidated and fortified into riverbanks so that they could become recognizable geographical formation. The first survey of the river system was conducted by the Territories Department of the East India Company in 1820 in order to ascertain the company's property claim. The subsequent acquisition process targeted all those lands that were either unclaimed or for which inhabitants were unable to produce a recognizable land title. The legal notion of boundary between land and water was thus established. The practice of a dry culture which marked the limits of rivers with lines was imposed on a wet culture of the Bengal Delta who were more accustomed to adapting to and negotiating with the ways of the water. Here in this image you see the red dot which is marking plot number 1862 a plot in Haimchor. And the documents that you see here on the far left is the first land deed that was a lease document produced by the British Empire. And the land was leased to the locals. And when the British Empire left the Indian subcontinent, they auctioned these lands to the locals and so the middle 
document shows actually the auction document and the ownership of the land. And then the third one uh, is actually a document uh, from the Pakistan period, which shows the inheritance which was then passed on from one generation to the next generation. When the land deed uh, remains fixed, the land has shifted because of its dynamic nature. So you see the, the drawings on top, which marks from 1972 till date, shows the location of plot number 1862. And you see that at one point in 2000, the land was already washed away by uh, the rivers. So in terms of inheritance, the owners of the land actually hold on to these papers with the hope that this will come back at some point in time. At times they do in one generation, at times within three, four generations it never comes to surface. So it's a hope that has been um, uh, imposed on people which wasn't supposed to be the case. So this has been our study, um, our findings of the entire uh, Delta area that we have um, tried to showcase here. And for the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, uh, we took these houses, three of these houses that we bought, and this was placed in the venue. We were given a courtyard in the venue, which is a abandoned an abandoned school, um, and that has been turned into a venue for the triennial. Three of our office of our office architects and one carpenter went from Bangladesh to Sharjah to make these houses. It took them about two weeks to build them, and here you see the houses in the context of Sharjah. Here on the left is the buildings in their own context. And on the right, you see it in the location of the triangle. Since March 2020, as Bangladesh went into lockdown, most of our project sites stopped. We had ample time to pursue our research further. We focused on the ultra-low income or no-income inhabitants of the Chor areas. Our idea was to design a mobile modular structure that is optimum in scale to house a family of four, which is easy to assemble and disassemble, also at a minimum cost by sourcing natural and locally available material and labor. In order to achieve this, we created a space frame structure with bamboo and steel joints that has two levels with a two square meter usable area. Total cost of one modular mobile house is US dollar 200. Our first prototype as seen here in the photograph is built by two architects from our office. Two levels of the mobile modular house is connected by a ladder-like stair, and both the spaces can be used by a family, while the lower level can be used for the daily activities, the upper level could be used for a space uh, for sleeping in the night. Next step of our research is to make the houses available to the coastal area and in the northern districts of Bangladesh, where the ultra-low income population are residing. Our idea is to study how they adapt and appropriate these structures for their own use. These structures can also be useful in the flood-prone areas of Bangladesh, especially in the northern part of the country.
directly with the sea level rise. This has also accelerated the process of erosion and accretion, including flooding. Adaptation to the changing phenomenon is a priority. The modular mobile house can potentially be instrumental in helping the climate victims with options and flexibilities. Thank you. Imran, you can start now. Did I start? Okay. Hello. Can you can you hear me, everyone? Okay. So, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Imran. Uh, I uh, I graduated from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. Uh, I, I mean, I received my bachelor's degree from there and back in 2004. And then uh, I went, I received my master's degree from uh, GST Harvard University and, and graduated from there back in 2007. And right after that, I had, a, had an opportunity to work for Stephen Hall's New York office for a couple of years almost. And then I got back to this city, uh, my beloved city, Dhaka, and started uh, a little practice. So it's been almost uh, 11 years, and um, I've been I've been still scratching the surface. Um, uh, so I, I, when my senior friend Bashkor uh, uh, informed me that uh, I. I need to present something uh, for this uh, event. Uh, I was not prepared because it's been like for a couple of years, I, I was trying to figure out what I've been up to. Uh, essentially like after being in the States for those five years, uh, the orientation, the exposure to different doors of knowledge uh, was kind of, uh, amazing for me. And, and I tried to uh, get a grasp of the discipline uh, and and try to sort of regurgitate some of the information and knowledge that I received so far and trying to put them together to make certain sense for me. So I, 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 I'm actually uh, taking this, uh, I, I was trying to understand the, the time, you know, that time that we are in and the, the sort of forces that globally operating. I mean, this, the, the world is, is increasingly connected and uh, the world has, you know, tons of and events and, and information and all sorts of things. And in this kind of environment, I mean, this, this, this scenario was, obviously not available like like 20 years ago. So the amount of communication, the amount of information that we're receiving and giving every day is, is enormous. And it, it has a huge impact on any individual. And what I realized is, uh, well, architecture is a mean for me to understand my own self, I mean, relating to the existing status quo, relating to the world, uh, how it is operating, you know, how it is affecting me. And also like trying to understand my participation in the collective. So this goes, uh, you know, essentially uh, in, the, in the field of architecture, like the way we, we deal with part of relationships. So knowing myself, you know, here my is not, is a kind of self-narcissist, my or me or I. It's, it's like a generation, I, I believe, uh, to get a grasp of, of things or ideologies or, you know, what Marx will call like false consciousness and all sorts of things to get an idea of the world and, and how these forces are individuating ourselves. So 
with that being said, what I'm interested in in, in, in the discipline of architecture, I, I, I appreciate the instrumental performances of building, but also I'm, I'm uh, enormously interested in existential projects. I mean, that to, um, to a degree uh, where, you know, it deals with psychological and, and existential problems. So what I, I, I'll be saying in this presentation is, is uh, the name of, I, I just named it as undetermined because I, I haven't decided yet. I haven't got any clue yet. So, so I'll be showing my works, the, the works that I've been engaged in for like last uh, 15 years, I would say. Although I'm practicing for 11 years, but I'm, I'm showing few of my works from my graduate schools so that uh, I, can, I, can I can manifest some of the ideas, but uh, to you so that it, to explain um, if it makes sense or, or not. So let's, let's uh, go and, and start the presentation. I hope you're all, you can all see this. Can you see this? Uh, can you want yes, to confirm? Can okay. So this is a project uh, that I did um, uh, back in 2006. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a project, uh, it's a studio project, actually, my second semester studio project. It was uh, uh, a museum for architecture and design. Uh, the site was in, uh, southern part of Spain. My professor was Dennis Riley, and uh, we were uh, we visited the site and we, we, we sort of um, get a grasp of the site and surrounding. But the program was something very fascinating for me, and uh, I'll I'll keep it very short because I'm going to show you a series of works. Uh, so so I will give you the the information in a digest form. So so I at that time back in 2000. Uh, six, I had two professors other that I'm taking other courses from these two professors, Michael Hayes and Jeff Kipnis. And I was really like overloaded with so much information. And I tried to, uh, you know, uh, understand this project from that sort of orientation. And one of the you know, famous discussion on, you know, uh, Democratic space, you know, as as architectural imagination by Jeff Kipnis. Uh, he was, uh, I, I was kind of fascinated with that. Although he was, he mentioned that it was not uh, greed. There are two existing models of of you know uh, architectural uh, you know imagination for democratic uh, space making. So these are organizational uh, mechanisms. So greed was greed kind of failed, and then the the world of collage came in and he's, he's arguing that collage is also waning and also is, uh, is uh, taking a new shape. He suggested something based on Matthias, uh, uh, what was this called, Robert Ungers, uh, the socio sociologist uh, of uh, Harvard Law School, I think. So the greed, so I, I initiated, I thought like I should, uh, I should exercise this first one, the greed, how to deal with the greed. So this program was about um, a museum of architecture and design. So the program was basically to archive um, drawings uh, and, and you know, some artifacts uh, also like museum for, for uh, you know, artworks. So this project, uh, had uh, this, uh, let, me, let, me just find this let me go to the second slide. So I took this greed as a, as a kind of basis of, uh, of organizing the site. And then the greed, uh, these are habitable grids. These are hugely, let me show you the, second, let's, the next slide. Then go back. So this, this greed is basically uh, the horizontal bars are considered like the archiving things and, and the vertical pieces uh, are the you know, residential accommodation for the scholars or visitors or students uh, to stay and, and do their research. Uh, and so that this is a collection from the world uh, and collection of 
uh, of artifacts and, and drawings and all sorts of information. So this, I envision this project as a, as a museum for the whole world. So, so the grid is operating uh, on a kind of ambition that it will, if, if you can see uh, the shape, the grid, the shape is, is guided by the available side. So it has some open ends so that it can grow. So as the collection grows, the grid also, uh, you know, invades uh, other areas so that it can expand. So the expandability was something that I, I looked for. So, so the, the, you can see this grid is, uh, and also like the grid is uh, offering the inhabitation of, of archival materials, but at the same time to violently disturb the grid with a diagonal, I inserted this diagonal volume that will uh, exhibit artworks. So this is the museum part is basically this diagonal. So it's kind of creating a dialogue of grid uh, versus uh, the diagonal. And the ground was critical for this project so because ground is always critical in architectural history. How do you create a ground? How do you make a ground condition? So the grid is actually uh, is dictating is ground condition as well. I took actually this as an opportunity because I sort of um, imagine a, a mobile, you know, four grid system that is that they call like paradise garden is a charba in Arabic term. I think it's Persian term, I think. So it's like a garden for the uh, heavens, you know. So, so the ground is occupied by this. Uh, so the landscape or the landform is basically uh, affirms the idea of charbak. So the ground is made uh, here, introducing a kind of historical references. Uh, so this is, as you can see, this is the this is the volume that the architecture is sticking out from the city fabric, and you can see the mountain in the background. And this is the this is the entry hall. Actually, this is huge. I mean, this, as you can see, the helicopters in it, you can see that so this is kind of exaggerated scale to reflect the scale of the project to affirm the worldness, uh, because this is a museum for the world. So, so this is a kind of exaggeration that I made. And you can see that the left image is basically the ground condition, you know, uh, this is a kind of abstract ground condition with charbag the grid, the charbag, the grids are basically uh, the walking passages, uh, you can see. Also that the grid, the top of the grid is is uh, occupiable. So you can see on the right image, the, the top of the grid is also occupied by uh, people. And also the grid is violently cutting through the uh, museum block diagonally. So there was this uh, tension which will uh, dominate, I mean, which will uh, which will cut which one. And so that was the kind of uh, situation that is negotiated here. So yeah, this is the project where, uh, you know, idea of uh, democratization, democratized space as a, as a form of architectural imagination. That is something that I tried to exercise with the grid and the diagonal. So in a, in the diagonal was uh, initially uh, in the early theories, uh, it was not considered, but I thought like it would be a one, nice idea to exercise that. So that this project was basically all about this uh, insertion of greed and, and, and the diagonal and, and celebrate the relationship and also like the consequences of it. So next project is basically a, a, a kind of sequel of that. So this is a this is a competition project that I also did with a friend in back in 2006. It's a, it's a Gunnar Asplund library in Sweden, Stockholm. So, you know, the, the thing is, uh, the library has this, uh, has a function, the program that is uh, kind of similar, like the library is a collection of books from the world and also library is a collection of thoughts from around the world. The same thing goes for the museum too, the program of the museum. So I thought like uh, I should take a piece of that grid because that grid has that kind of, you know, expendability, you know, sort of uh, homogeneity. So I, I, I took a piece of that and sort of framed this uh, Gunnar Esplan library. So it's, it, it was a coincidence for me because the, the grid, the, 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 the Esplan library was square in this plan. So I put this grid 
on top of this, as you can see here. So it's not actually uh, disturbed. The, the, the old library was not disturbed by this insertion. It's kind of uh, uh, protecting it, you know, the uh, kind of assurance of, of the library, the old library. So this was a kind of an idea of taking a piece from uh, other previous uh, uh, work and then try to uh, insert in a new setting to explore new possibilities. So this is uh, this was another uh, uh, kind of a continuation of the greed issue, uh, as you can see here. So this is actually I, I, I was looking at this painting by uh, uh, Manet, and what he was doing is he the left image is the old musician, and he drew it. You can see the character on the on the right. He actually re redrew it. He remade it uh, uh, as as a with a new background, with a new setting, the the, the absinthe drinker. So I was thinking like this kind of uh, exercise actually happened in in art world as well. So so yeah. The next one is uh, this is a project uh, that I did. Uh, it's, it's called the. Architects Institute uh, in Bangladesh, in Dhaka. Uh, at the first glance, basically, you can see this project as a kind of, a, uh, you know, a remaking of John Haydock. And John Haydock was very, uh, uh, I was really fascinated by his works when Michael Hayes used to uh, teach us in, in our class of the 70s and 80s uh, um, architectural imagination class. And I found this, uh, this really fascinating. So. Here you can see I I, I was uh, I, I was working with the team and that, that we, we thought like well, we we should take this you know John Haydock's buy house you know there are like uh, several things I was doing in this project actually number one uh, you can see let me show the second slide you can see the on the left or in the middle drawing you see that I took the wall house uh, as a kind of a point of origin and then as a sort of diagram. And then I sort of uh, took out the wall uh, and uh, not actually took out the wall, I gave certain thickness to it. So the, the, the wall becomes habitable. So in, in, in John Haydock's case, uh, the, you enter the building, in the, you enter the by house uh, in, a, in an orthogonal direction from a right angle. And you enter that the programs of the house was basically divided into three segments and the, the lower segment has like teardrop window and then the middle one has sort of uh, his new window systems and the top one has ribbon window. Here in this case, what I, uh, with my team was thinking like, we didn't differentiate those characters. We were kind of uh, making a collage like effect on the surface. So these, these clinging volumes are basically, uh, you know, kind of uh, expressing a kind of independence uh, and also creating a new character for this uh, new setup, new setting. So this was, and also the second thing I was, uh, we were doing is like, as you can see on the street side, uh, we have this uh, circular opening, you know, the kind of the wall, you can see uh, the, the interior uh, of the wall, of the taken wall and the circulations. But this is uh, this is this was kind of intentional because the site is very near to Louis Kahn's assembly building, so we were kind of considering it as a uh, as a as a kind of uh, ghost of the father, you know. It's like it is it is kind of affirming its proximity to that uh, uh, historical and important building. So this is kind of a, uh, assurance to that project, and also like uh, we were. Uh, dealing with so we have programmatic requirements and we sort of uh, we didn't you know uh, conceive this project as an independent individual like block or, or, or object so we had to introduce another volume so we we sort of uh, struggle with this idea how to because it, it, what are the possibilities that we can have uh, to add another volume. So we, we put this volume, as you can see in these drawings, in, in a right angle. So over here, you will see this, uh, the, this is the public entrance hall, basically, the waiting hall. So, so this is kind of meeting. This is, uh, as you know, that John Haydock has uh, all, the, all his archipelagos and all that. 
he has this in tangential relationship between objects, you know, they, they don't overlap or intersect in, in most of his cases. But so we, we sort of like, like the idea that the way this is meeting at the point. So this creates the corner, you know, that corner was not created first, that the situation actually allowed us to, to you know, um, to discover, I should say, the, the entry. So the entry was formed by this uh, the intersecting or in, not intersecting tangential uh, relationships. And on the other hand, uh, if you see the, the courtyard, so we in the court, this, because it's an institute for architects and students, so we, we sort of inserted uh, the, the field so that the vacant field is occupied by John Haydock's nine grid problem for the students. This is a very classic uh, discussion about nine grid problems. So as a kind of marker, you know, so the, the field is occupied with these grid systems so that you can uh, you can identify this as a typologically as an institute or, or you know some sort of uh, you know, architectural education uh, architectural engine educational machine so so then then what we did is if you look at this old image in the previous image the grid is not actually operating on the plane on the plaza this is also uh, we sort of projected it on the wall you know it's kind of creating a diptic moment you know so so th this so it creates another level of relationship with the uh, with the volume and the, the and then the and the uh, plaza so that was the kind of exercise we were doing in this project and uh, uh, so the next one is actually the uh, in, in the same area but it's, it's a little bit far away from this uh, institute building this is a museum for uh, uh, war museum is called, and I we, we we did similar sort of operation. We take the volume, as you can see. Uh, this is the this is the national assembly building, as you can see in the bottom, and then the right is the site uh, for this museum. And the architect institute was somewhere here. So so as we were kind of affirming that in the previous case we had circular windows, but here we had we took the opportunity to introduce two sort of symbolic gestures to affirm the ghost of the father. So here the wall is, as you can, let me show you this drawing. So here the wall is here uh, and uh, the, the, the clinging volumes are not there actually. So it, it was kind of, you know, we didn't want that constellation sort of character to this because we, it's, it's a museum for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the big, for the, uh, our martyrs. So, we try to give a kind of cohesive and coherent uh, or a unified uh, kind of expression uh, as, as a nation. So we, we try to create this triangle wedge-like volume to express that sort of idea. So, so we have also these uh, you know, circular openings as a kind of reminder of its presence in that vicinity. So, so again, this wall is, I took this wall as a kind of uh, uh, instrument for operating on this idea. And you can see this wall, this is wall is huge. And we tried to, you know, break it into, uh, break the scale of it. So in, from internally and externally. So you can see the effect. So it can be illuminated like that. So it, 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 it also erases the, almost erases the, you know, the soft, the hardness or the, 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 the massiveness of this wall. So now, so the, again, so this is another project. This is a house project that I did, uh, uh, in, in the city, uh, it's in uh, Dhaka. Ed, sorry, Emre, just we need to try and keep these to twelve minutes. I, could, could you try and wind this up? Sorry, we're running out of oh, okay, time. Sure, sure, Thank sure, you. sure. Great presentation. Okay, okay. okay. So this is a uh, this is a house, and uh, again, this is the same uh, idea of you know inserting that volume. Uh, but here in this case, the site is constrained uh, by the uh, for this length, you know. So we we had this bending condition. The the wall is basically bending at a right angle. So uh, again, so this is here, the, the wall, that, that volume is actually mutilated. And you can see the wall is kind of fused into a single volume. And it's, it's, it's violently, as you can see in the plan, is, is forced, is internally forced to, you know, uh, to change its, you know, route, change its, you know, direction of movement. So the volume is uh, that the programmatic pressure is is taking out its space, and uh, thus we can get this kind of configuration of the volume of the of the wall. So 
Okay, so you can see the end product is like that. You can see the, the, the lights. Uh, since it's a, it's, a, it's a build project, so we can uh, we, we try to experiment with the, the sort of light condition and interior conditions, how that wall is going to happen, uh, what sort of uh, experience it can produce. So you can see this, uh, uh, the effects of this volume. It's very expressive from the uh, outside of also from the inside, you can experience it, the scale of it, the, the character of the space. And again, this, this, is, this is going on. Uh, actually, I have like uh, many more <laughs> projects, I, I might not be able to finish it, but I will wrap it here. This is the, I, I, I was taking it a little bit far again. So like you can see this, this, this in previous case, it was, it was kind of uh, stopped here. Eh? It, it, couldn't, it couldn't go further because of the height limitation all that. But in this scheme, we sort of found it, found it possible to do, to take it all the way to the top. So it, it became the character of the building. It basically, uh, you know, manifest his presence and also like it, it created this character. So the, the stair is taking a, 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 a significant sort of importance in this earlier works or, or even like the evolution of it in the later works. So that's, this is what we did with this stair. As you can see, the spaces are coming out differently. So I'll be showing one more project. So at Steven's office, I was, uh, looking at some of his old works, there's one project uh, called Gandini House. I, it, I think it, it didn't get published or it was not built. And there was another project he did for a museum in Cassino, Cassino in Italy. So he was doing these studies. I was fascinated with this and I was really uh, moved by the play of light and shades and shadows and all that. So I, I personally uh, looked into them carefully and exercised them on a very personal level. So, so back in 2008, I think, I, I participated in a competition for a con museum for Constantin Brancusi. Uh, so the site was right in front of the computer center. So you can see the, the piece here. I was fascinated with uh, Steven's idea of uh, light and also like the sculptures of Richard Serra. So I was trying to uh, incorporate this two into a project so that I can do some exercise. As you can see here, so I have these Richard Serra-like effects on the exterior, but Richard Serra would never cut his volumes like that. So I was trying to do it uh, uh, to make a kind of a, a, you know, experiment. And then you see like the, the inner shell is protected by this, uh, this outer shell. And so the, the, as you, in, the, in the plan, you see these two passages. Yes, it creates an entry point, also creates an exit point. So this is how uh, the, the project was uh, conceived and you know the, the, the two walls that are creating the entry moment we have these characters on the top but on the other side uh, you can see the cars are larger to allow more light to come in so that was the exercise that I did I and mean, I was kind of studying some of the how the light dances on the surfaces curved surfaces uh, during the daytime uh, at different time of the day as you can see in these images and I, I was also uh, checking how the interior light condition or, or interior space could come out because uh, I'm sure, uh, I, I don't know if I, I, uh, if Richard said I ever did any horizontal sculpture uh, with his uh, court in steel, but uh, here I was, I was kind of challenged by this, how to intersect this vertical and horizontal place to make it uh, an architectural project. So yeah, so these are these uh, uh, spaces that came out uh, as a final product. So, so I should, uh, Neil, uh, how much uh, time would you allow me? I, I, I think I think we're going to wrap up now because we, we okay, so okay. it should be twelve minutes. But um, uh, okay, okay, uh, but, excellent. But thanks, but, but thank you. Sure, sure, sure. So, so that's about it. I mean, so this is the journey that I've been going through for the last um, fifteen years. I, actually, I have more uh, of these, but. Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still like baking and uh... and uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Shimona. Hello? Yes.
Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. And we could also hear the right. traffic in, of, of Dakar. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, so I'll share. Right, so, sorry, is, is this visible? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm Ismat Hossein, uh, but I am more known as Shumana, Neil and many of my other um, associations all know me by that name. So I've been trained at BUIT, um, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology, and I later went to Dessau uh, for my master's, and there I met Neil, and, and of course we had a very eventful one and a half year in the most, one of the most uneventful cities probably uh, that there could be in Europe. So um, I'm going to talk today about, I think I'm, I'm not, I think I'm basically going to kind of raise some questions, um, some questions that I myself have been pondering about. And um, I don't think that um, I'm, quite near the answers yet, but th th there's kind of always at the background of most of the things that I do. I also teach, I have a very small practice and I teach at a university here at the Department of Architecture. And um, most of the work uh, that I do both in the studio and in my own practice comes from a critique, a constant questioning of uh, the local. So. Um, I'm going to keep my camera off um, because I have a little issue with my face right now. So where do we turn this off? Um, I seem to get this. Can you still see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. All right. So I'm going to start um, by an inquiry into what we uh, think of as the local. Um, so is it, is it like an antonym for the global? And in that case, what do we mean by the global? Is there an implicit referral to a more peripheral position in the term local? Or is it considered to be at par with the global? So, and in the end, isn't the global actually just an overarching reinterpretation of the center? Uh, the idea of which has been, you know, reiterated and systematically institutionalized through the idea of the world map, which is uh, basically uh, the unraveling of a spherical object onto a two dimensional page and every time we have uh, Europe in the center. And um, these questions pose a very um, crucial problematic in the understanding of the local. It suggests that the perception of the local, even for the locals themselves, is not really a linear perception. Um, it's more a nonlinear construction that evolves uh, through the dynamics of variable forces, knowledge systems, institutions, cultural practices, 
and of course history and so what we know today as bangladesh um has a very deep rooted um geopolitical history that is tied to this whole subcontinent i think um you've seen marina first pr uh, presentation so uh, she gave a very i think informative kind of historical overview of that but this historicity uh, plays a very crucial and complex role in the understanding of the local as well so that would suggest maybe that the local as we see it itself may also be a kind of myth. It's a myth that has been formed by a very dominant uh, global perspective. Say, for example, the term civilized or developed, these have become kind of synonymous with uh, first world uh, and which is basically another name for the center. So I, the question I constantly kind of ask myself is that uh, through this process, has there been certain aspects of the local that through time um, have been repressed or subjugated, overturned or overlooked in um, favor of more acceptable or generalized notions? So. I'd like to show you an example of what I mean by um, this very simple um, object, which is called a datun. So it's basically a twig of a neem branch. Neem is a very common tree and known for its very uh, medicinal properties. So this twig um, used to be once used uh, for by people, by locals, uh, to clean their teeth in the morning. This was a very common practice. And in the villages, you would see people in the morning going around with a neem twig uh, in their mouth. So a lot of the knowledge that we have, a lot of the, um, the identities that we build are in today's world um, motivated by um, media and of course, um, marketing. And interestingly, when we were small, when we were kids, we would see ads on the TV that would say um, that if you use, say, this daton or coal dust, which was another popular thing that people, you, locals use, um, you, you, your teeth will get weaker and uh, eventually you'll be um, having different kinds of dent oral issues. And of course, the solution was toothpaste. But more recently, and so we also thought that, oh, okay, so this is a very primitive, very backward kind of way of doing it, uh, cleaning your th teeth, and we need to kind of, you know, to get be, become modern, um, we need to start using toothpaste. And eventually now, um, I see in the supermarkets um, that this neem has been kind of repackaged and it's being sold as a herbal toothpaste. And just recently, and during this lockdown, I because I'm doing a lot of shopping online, I ordered toothpaste and they sent me this uh, one with the cold powder and apparently it's supposed to make your teeth more whiter. So this reinterpretation of the local um, as like, which is known as the post fortis um, condition obviously um, has a significant role on our, um, in the building of our identities or in the idea of the local, as does, of course, the reappropriation of the global itself into the local, the kind of reappropriation, re acclimatization of the global that we uh, see in our local architecture and which has been kind of systematically institutionalized as well um, into our understanding of architecture, into our understanding of um, architectural form. And this institutionalization has not ceased with just the institutionalization of modernization 
but has kind of um, passed on throughout the other genres and episodes of architectural uh, evolution of the understanding of architecture and the philosophy of architecture. And uh, we constantly see uh, this kind of reappropriation in our contemporary architectural practice as well. So um, our academic curriculum, uh, the school I went to, is very much based on a global view of architecture. And of course, um, that is synonymous to the Western school of thought. And uh, for the longest time, we have seen that um, the local, uh, the local forms of building, uh, what for the lack of a better word I can call indigenous architecture, is actually considered as a very marginalized or primitive form of building. And the more acceptable form is obviously um, a more acclimatized modernist vocabulary. So the haptic conditions through which architectural form emerges in our local context are kind of inexplicably excluded from any kind of discourse that we um, pertain to. So um, for me, I um, have been kind of uh, going back and forth into a journey of sorts um, throughout different parts of Bangladesh. And I have tried to understand the local um, context, the local um, modes of building, the local, the way that architecture actually um, kind of rises out as um, a kind of um, if it kind of the form kind of evolves from the complexity of its context from this kind of um, intricate relationship of different parameters the dynamics of these relationships and how that kind of um, comes out into the building of architectural form and the building of architectural vocabulary. And even here we have this kind of romanticization because uh, we have this idea of the Bengal hut as the primary architectural form for um, indigenous households. But um, this too is a misconception. It's, it's, it's a myth in many ways because uh, this entire delta it has so many variations of um, topography. And so even if it's an apparently very flat landscape, it is crisscrossed by these rivers and these water bodies. And these create immense uh, diversity in landform, in soil type, soil conditions, um, in uh, climatic aspects, in bi biodiversity. And this has a very rich impact on the overall um, architectural vocabulary that is um, kind of developed. So I'm just going to talk about a few issues in no particular order um, that we come across in architecture. And uh, we have very distinct views about um, in general this uh, architectural discourse. So the first issue is uh, transience. And uh, as you've seen in uh, Marina Pa's, um presentation transitoriness is a very um it's it's very just essential to um our uh, landscape it, it's 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 one of the major truths of our landscape if you if you we could put it like that so um this landscape obviously is shaped by this um uh landform the, these high rugged landforms all around us and the waters that flow from there and into the sea and then back in again the, this kind of even uh, flow of water is basically what gives uh, our landform its shape and this transitoriness is so um, basic to the existence of the people it is so 
um, intricate to the way that their lives form, to the way that they go, ab go about on their daily lives and how they kind of perform their um, different activities throughout the year. Uh, it, it, and it also shapes the architecture in different regions, in different ways. So this is like, a, this is a house in uh, Butuakali, which is um, uh, in one of the places near the mouths of the deltas. So it's one, uh, one of the places where the water comes in from the Bay of Bengal and seeps into the land. And um, this place is reoccurrently um, salvaged by uh, surges, tidal surges, storms and such. So even if there's no major cyclone, just normal tidal surges are a very common occurrence in this part of the land. And the house in particular is created in such a way that it kind of hugs the landform and uh, it creates this, um, it kind of crouches on the land and it kind of, and on a very high plinth. And you can, and it has this very intricate mesh of um, bamboo that kind of creates this monolithic uh, structure that holds it together um, against the wind and the surges. And you you will not find this kind of house form anywhere else in Bangladesh. So it's just it's a very particular kind of solution that forms from the dynamics of that particular area. And um, in our studio projects, we often come across uh, different uh, situations in which uh, we try to kind of create um, more contextual solutions for uh, different localities. So um, recently I did a project, um, one of my studios did a project um, for Mishorai, which is basically um, in this region. So it's in it's um, in Chittagong. And unlike the other parts of Bangladesh in which we have the water coming in from the north, uh, this a part of the country, the water actually flows in from the east. It flows from east to west to the Bay of Bengal. So, and this, this huge mountain range on the east creates a, um, web of uh, tributaries that kind of flow, canals that flow through this land. So uh, recently there's um, been development, it, it's already started, of an economic zone which has taken up a considerable amount of, I think, 3,000 acres of land um, across uh, the edge of the bay. and they have created, um, to create this, they've already created severe environmental havoc and so on. So we wanted to see how this um, economic zone could be uh, done in an alternate way through which uh, you could still have this um, economic development, the scope of economic development, but at the same time, you would allow the natural landscape and the natural um, uh, the kind of um, biodiversity and um, the, the people, the, so, the social cultural fabric that was already there um, to kind of continue uh, growing and uh, developing along with it. So these are some of the uh, works that our students did. And in all of their work, water was a very crucial element. The, the kind of reconnection and the kind of um, renovation of the canals and the water bodies and kind of using those for transportation and connecting different public spaces and so on. So all of that kind of uh, came in and created a very different language that we're generally used to seeing in um, urbanization because um, in general, we have a very kind of gridiron kind of layout that is kind of superimposed on any kind of organic development. But here we try to kind of form a more sensitive approach to 
the existing landscape, the water and uh, the way of uh, the, the people that, there, that were living there, uh, who, who obviously during this huge economic heist would be kind of up, uprooted from their own homes uh, in the process. Another issue is um, the issue of temporality. So obviously um, time has been one of the most crucial um, issues um, in any talk of architecture, in any dialogue of architecture and or discourse of architecture. And this uh, dialogue has more than often been in favor of attaining permanence um, as opposed to um, something that could decay or something that could kind of slowly or change or evolve. So, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, the height of architectural expression has uh, kind of been in creating a timeless statement. But in a topography like ours, where um, The topography itself is always transitory. It's always in flux. The issue of permanence seems uh, a kind of coerced um, concept. So, different indigenous communities is um, sorry that. Um, a sari is, I don't know if many of you know, it's a basic garment that uh, women in our subcontinent wear. So it's a continuous piece of cloth that is wrapped around um, and then draped over your body. So uh, this sari has a multitude of um, uses. Af even after a woman has done wearing and it's been ripped and you know sewn and then ripped again, and then you have a uh, different, it's kind of uh, reused, reinterpreted in many ways. Uh, even like in this case, I saw it used, hung over a fence that had, was kind of torn in certain places. So the sari was kind of added uh, to as a, uh, as a screen. Hello? We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay, because I, I, there was a, a sign saying my inter internet connection is unstable. All right, so um, so as I was saying, so this, this issue of um, temporality is kind of seen as a perpetual force. It's one that constantly transforms the landscape and within it, the habitats that are shaped with it. So uh, the build form, therefore, allows for different kinds of flexibility. It allows for change and adaptation, <clears throat> and it, you, it, it, it allows for cracks or ruptures or fissures. And it, it also allows for mending. It also allows for a kind of um, systematic maintenance of the build form, one that is a very kind of haptic, um, a very sensual kind of uh, process that involves um, the sense of touch, tactility, and so on. So um, this concept of architecture allows for something um, that is, that, that it allows imperfection, it allows for restoration, and it allows that um, you do not have to have exact perfection of dimensions. And um, a lot of it goes with um, a more haptic sense of uh, the different elements, different dynamics uh, of material, of topography, of um, the vegetation that you find in your area, of the mode of production that you are engaged with and all of those come into um, the building of architectural form and <clears throat> this this idea of architecture is for us uh, it's it's very difficult for us to grasp at first because we are so used to having 
a very you know grounded very finished kind of concept of architecture um so this is a project we did <clears throat> quite some time ago so um and it they asked us to do a dining hall for a, a madrasa uh, which is a school of uh, or it's an orphanage basically so uh, the the orphanage this, this huge uh, this very long building is the main dorm where the students reside and we were asked to do a dining come um, study hall for these students uh, in, and this was the area in front of the pond where we were asked to do it so um, we uh, when we went about with this project we obviously had a very we had these whole set of working drawings and visualizations and so on but at the end of the day um, they only constructed part of it they didn't construct the kitchen and um, later on they ran out of funds and they could not finish the rest of it but this imperfection this uncompleteness um, does not really uh, stop the fact from it being used it's still very much uh, used all the time and you could I, uh, I looked up their website yesterday and they constantly have different events going on here except for the daily ones of course that are always going on but it's it's a very used space that um the students uh, are always occupied it's always occupied and put into use so this sense of incompleteness this sense that time can actually kind of um play a role in the shaping of a building in the occupation of a building in, in the occupation of architecture is um, a very interesting fact and we also tried doing uh, later on we tried incorporating this idea of um, temporality into a landscape project where we had a wall that we wanted to kind of age with time so we uh, had this very rough concrete texture that was embedded uh, that uh, on site and we allow we didn't planted it with different kinds of um, along with other different plants we also kind of different of ferns that generally grow of, um, fissures of uh, damp wall spaces and uh, eventually that kind of grew by itself and the um, uh, texture and i think this this temporality um kind of gives architecture a very different um um attitude which is often maybe um missed out in um when we're just attaining for perfection another issue is um the issue of tangibility which of course is uh, very central to uh, modernist thought and of course um, postmodern and both postmodern and post-structural theory have redressed this issue uh, through introducing various ideas like uh, um, subjectivity or um, uh, other various kinds of um, ideas, but um, in general, we see, uh, I think, um, tangibility uh, can be seen to kind of evolve form in a way that is so subtle, that is so, um, you can, um, it's, it's, uh if, if to to the western eye it's i think or, or the eye that is trained by western doctrine it's very difficult to kind of see the different forces behind the development of this kind of form but um just like uh these um fungi which i i, I got this picture from a forest uh, called shakchuri um, which the fungi kind of uh, take hold of different parts of this fallen uh, tree 
and uh, according to the moisture and the sunlight that it's getting or the sh absence of sunlight um, and the different kinds of elements that it requires, it kind of sprouts out of different parts of the tree um, in a very random kind of pattern. But of course, there is an underlying pattern of uh, the different parameters that it needs to grow. And I think a lot of the architectural process in um, indigenous built form is very uh, like this kind of um, uh, process, this kind of biological process. And uh, I've seen this in uh, the hill tracks. This is a, this image is from Bandarbon, and it's it's from a specific um, tribal village called the Kumis. So uh, there are different in uh, different kinds of tribes within the hill tracks themselves, and each one has a different uh, way of building. It, it, they they even have different topographies that they occupy. Some occupy the hill tops, some the slopes, and then some the um, lower grounds, the more um, flat area regions. So this particular village, uh, as I said. It, the kind of pattern that emerges from this development is a lot like the image of the fungi that I uh, showed you earlier. And you can see that the, the houses kind of um, uh, spring out of different uh, locations along the ridge. And obviously there are conditions for um, uh, the slope and uh, how much uh, land they have and uh, the kind of uh, the shade and the vegetation and uh, the way the water flows and so on. So this this um, is a very interesting kind of um, way of seeing architecture. And um, of course, you would not expect it in uh, communities that still live uh, in the most basic, in the most um, so-called primitive uh, means of life. And Yet they have this very subtle, very um, untangible understanding of the landscape, of the topography, of their context through which uh, the build form kind of emerges out of. And I find this fascinating. And uh, we did this um, very small um, structure for a group of um, researchers they're uh, by um, wildlife conservationists so they didn't they needed a platform um observatory platform that would be built as like a tree house on a on top of the trees to observe some um, uh, animal uh, movement on the ground and they asked us to um, show their um head builder um, a structure that they could build. So we basically um, asked them, we gave them this model and we told them to find uh, the branches on which they would actually lay a certain dimension and just um, kind of connect the points so that they would get a flat area as much as possible. So because they needed a flat platform um, to further equipment. So and the rest, we told them that they could kind of, you know, do what they do, what they're good at, and kind of um, uh, sort it out by themselves. But the basic dimensions and uh, the basic um, pitch of the roof and all that, that was kind of given to them as uh, this three-dimensional object. And they actually had it done. So. This, uh, I think, I find it fascinating the way that um, the people that uh, build in these communities without any um, tools, without any knowledge of numbers or measurements, uh, they, they, they have their own vocabulary, their own understanding, their very um, untangible way of kind of dealing with these issues. Uh, for Subana, we better yeah, wrap it up fairly soon. Because, okay. Okay. So this, uh, the, I'm, I'm going to um, 
I don't have too many slides left. So this, the last issue is the, uh, the issue of uh, habitat, how, how we think of developing habitat. We, we usually think of development and um, through that development definitely has a certain image. It has a certain kind of um, different connotations of what development means. And it usually has to do with um, a lot of uh, roads and transportation and uh, multi-level uh, transportation nodes and so on. And when when I um, when I've traveled uh, into these villages, I find that uh, the issue of habitation of living on the land is a far more natural process. It's a lot like uh, the wildlife that habit inhabit those spaces and it's um just as they are kind of um very uh fitted into those uh in those contexts and often even camouflaged into those contexts i find the build form is also very much um coming from that sense of habitation and it is so different from what uh, we learn at architecture schools, what we learn in uh, as, uh, as the process of architecture, as the process of um, development, or as the process of building and construction. And of course, um, that understanding is kind of um, coupled with a lot of other issues. Um, the economics of the place, the mode of production, the different, um, the, the topography there, the kind of vegetation, the wildlife, all of that kind of comes together in the overall understanding of the habitat. So this is um, another project that I, we were doing. And I, I just wanted to show this because it was a very interesting journey for me um, in which Economics played a very vital role. So this this was a school that we were doing for a charitable organization um, in Tetulia, which is um, at the northernmost uh, tip of Bangladesh, and it's a very it's it's like the marginalized among the marginalized. So um, it's like um, the farthest point from where I live, I think. So it um, in this uh, community. Uh, there was a person who was uh, who wanted to do a school for the underprivileged children of that area uh, of the tea work, the children of the tea workers uh, that work in the tea estate. So he initially had this very big vision of making a school and a lot of land was promised to him. And a lot of people also promised to finance. And so we made the initial drawing. Uh, based on those dimensions. But later on, uh, the, all these promises slowly kind of started to fade. And eventually, he was just left with a very small piece of land, which uh, he originally had bought. And through this process lasted for about three or four years. So we each time he uh, felt um, heartbroken, we would kind of reassure him, oh, it's okay, we can still do something here, it's fine. And we would also change our design and our drawings and go for something else. But what is interesting about this project is that um, we try to incorporate uh, the local knowledge, the local craftsmen uh, into the building process. And we had them, we studied the different ways that uh, the wall, the people constructed in that area. And we use that um, in the entire partitioning of um, both the exterior and the interior um, walls. So we wanted to have the people there that were at, at, at the extreme end of um, uh, marginalization uh, to kind of have this sense of self reassurance that the way that they build would actually be something that could create uh, a structure that was habitable 
and um, for and usable for their children and for their future generations. So, I think that's so we're going to really have to, to wrap this up here. So yeah, I a... I'm done. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's now my turn. Um, me and Vashkar, uh, we're going to present our work. Um, and <laughs> Merry Christmas to you all. Um, I guess you have already uh, already we get a grasp that we are a long talker. <laughs> uh, so whether I can finish it in 12 minutes or not, I, I do not know. Uh, at best 15 minutes, I, I guess. So finger cross. Okay, so I'm going directly to uh, the, uh, the presentation uh, that I have prepared. Um, in this part, uh, we're going to introduce an ongoing research work uh, which is distantly connected with architecture, yeah. rather more connected uh, to design. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, as I was saying, um, this is more connected to design than architecture. Uh, both of us, Ash Ashik Bhaskar and Masku Mamun, uh, are former students of Neil Lake and uh, are currently involved in teaching in Bangladesh. Um, as the academic inclination, as well as the general professional trend uh, of architecture is predominantly following modernism, it is hard to ignore the omnipot uh, omnipotent presence of the icon and modernism as the modern masters. Um, Just uh, is uh, me. Okay, sorry about that. As I was saying that, um, um, as we, uh, architectural thing in Bangladesh is uh, predominantly uh, modern, uh, following modernism, uh, we cannot actually avoid, and uh, we cannot actually, uh, when we talk about architecture, we cannot. Uh, actually ignore uh, the, uh, the the modernistic approach of, of design. Uh, but in recent de decades, there has been a slowly growing call for introspection to look beyond the Eurocentric gate towards more to the root. Our research is also inclining at that theme, And we want to focus on what has uh, been left out um, even in the search for Ruth, the voice of the subordinate. This session is named Local Voices. So we wanted to talk about local, local voices, not only the local voices, in the sense of Bangladeshi, I mean, the local voices, the subordinate voices of, of, of Bangladesh. Um, what we wanted in our study is to shed light in our day-to-day -day life design decisions that people regularly take to solve a problem, especially when resources and finances uh, is limited. We are intrigued uh, by small, mundane, generally neglected creativity of people and found that they can add heavily um, in the academic study of design. Uh, this example of uh, appropriation of a plastic bottle to circulate breeze to the driver of an auto rickshaw who sits in the vacuum zone behind a wing seat. Or uh, this example of slow burning jute probe acting as a day long. Uh, active lighter for cigarettes in front of a key stall or making a makeshift vendor stall uh, using the what is available on site. Um, these are the things um, that are often ridiculed, laughed at, and never taken seriously for, for which it is what it is, a creative solution of a problem. We took Dhaka City as our study area 
and focused on the hundreds of varieties of tree vendors, hawkers, buskers, martins that are probably the most common element that you may find walking along a Dhaka tree. There are many varieties that are quite common for us, uh, but others may find them amusing, uh, like a money changer who takes old torn notes, exchanges them with brand new banknotes, um, or a makeshift saloon, um, or someone who shines your used mobile phone to give it a gl glittering effect, or a shooting range, a portable shooting range, or uh, an ear cleaner who uh, is more like a street doctor. Um, but apart from their uniqueness, uh, what we found that the elements and the decisions that they need to take for their day-to-day -day wage earning, the, the products that they carry, um, the way they present themselves, uh, the spatial organization um, they adopt, um, the location that they choose, uh, the mood that they create, all are results of optimization based on various related open contradictory parameters. Everything has a reason behind it or can be read uh, in a context. If we look at the location of hawkers in Sheketek residential area where, where I live in, uh, the location choice of hawkers from morning take a significant, um, this is what happens in the morning, but it takes a significant um, change uh, during the office ending time, something like this. And this is because uh, the office in, in, in the opening time, as most of the vendors occupy the left side of the street to connect with the returnees from the offices who sometimes buy groceries before entering house. This imbalance uh, between these two sides of the road has created opportunity for those type of vendors like Puchkawala or Kebab Maker, whose customer love to see them preparing food and spend relaxed time. And interestingly, during the lunch time at noon, many interesting vendors are uh, seen calling for customers, um, mainly focusing on the housewives, uh, like this customer's uh, cosmetic seller, uh, kitchen knife sharpener, um, a kitchen, kitchen utensil exchanger, and many of uh, uh, which we do not actually see in other time of the uh, of the day, especially when the male members are present in the household. This has become a kind of part of cultural landscape, especially in, in the older and relatively conservative part of Dhaka. There are many interesting coupling of vendors too. An under construction site may attract someone who sells medicine for muscle pain. A uh, morning walk um, attracts a weight machine and a blood pressure uh, measuring vendor. Uh, we try to find the flocking behavior of vendors around potential attractive points, different time uh, of the day. Um, uh, and the attractive points here um, are uh, the play field, the school and college gate, street nodes, back and land, etc. Um, we found that the same type of vendor adapt different strategies according to the urban zoning and economy of the city. A, a tea seller at a busy transport node must be efficient to mass producing many cups of tea in one motion, and his all uh, effort of organizing space is focused on that. While in, in, the, uh, in the residential area, tea sellers need to think about space organization. Uh, the drinkers can easily have a nice cup of tea in their dining room. So they come to the tea stall not for the tea, rather to have a friendly chat with friends and neighbors, just to have a smoke. Uh, so uh, the uh, sellers occupy a suitable corner in the alley, 
uh, make arrangement for a bench uh, to sit on and mostly rely on the fact that no customer will drink just one cup of tea. Sometimes they become friends with customers, even their place is not a permanent one. And the tea stall itself is an act of multiplicity. Let's take an example of a special food selling vendors like Chanachur or Badamwala, who sells special, special crunchy snacks and nuts. If the parameter, uh, I think we've lost Mitham. Mithun, we, we can't hear you. I think you've frozen. Uh, please, I'm going to try and call them and see if what the matter is. No, it's okay, Shubhana. Just 30 seconds. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, Vasco, what, what is the problem? Okay, 10 seconds, please, 10 seconds. Okay. What option could be to start the final presentation and then come, come back to um, Nathan? I, I think they're trying to fix it. Is Kobe Bay available? I love the fact we can hear the sounds of um, Dakar from you, from you, Shaman. I can hear the street outside. That is very Dakar. I'm sorry. I, I should I should keep my mic off. <laughs> Vasco, I think we should move on to the next presentation. Sorry. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry, it's about the internet connection here. Uh, and I'm now joining with Vasco's uh, connection. I, I hope uh, I, can, uh, I can connect from here. Just, uh, just give me a minute. I want to uh, go to the share screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, is my screen uh, visible?
visible now yes yes okay okay as i was talking about uh, the special um, food selling vendor like chanachur or badamola who sells special crunchy snacks and nuts if the parameter is the mobility and status of the vendor uh, we find patterns of handheld uh, crotch held head, head held uh, version we find uh, the patterns of one wheel uh, two wheel or uh, three wheel even four wheel version depending on the investment and the catchment area each of them have different design considerations and usually they come up with something by themselves or with the help of the neighbor um, about the presentation and attraction parameters it starts with dress up uh, like this gesture like interesting dress up um, who came up with this fashion idea we do not know but it has become a norm in many cases this presenting themselves um, is a tool used by many other vendors too uh, just like this one uh, where fashion fashion item sellers for ladies do also become like a ramp, ramp model themselves uh, and uh, taking a kind of girly look um, about uh, same can also be said for the containers almost all food seller use color red as a background for attracting clients and this can be traced back uh, to the culture of mazar um, or religious tom usually wrapped with red settings hence minimizing the psychological unhygienicness of the food uh, the sense of color composition is also quite evident here as uh, you can see here the red background for slices of fruits blue for the fresh ones and and brown for the earthy color nuts and seeds probably the most learning um, of uh, matter of this study is the optimization in terms of functional use uh, in such small container or areas uh, given the limited budget um, the way they tie the jars together um, uh, the bottom part of the bowl as cash uh, cash management um, the ingredients on right hand side on the left hand side the product placement um, considering the client behavior and testing touching objects uh, without picking a temper his work every example can be unique study uh, of function and optimized uh, design exercises and probably the last but not the least is the parameter of beauty the patterns that they make with their products and sometimes uh, very eye soothing and then that's why workers of dhaka are often subject to photographers uh, for their colors and patterns so there are many more things to say, uh, but uh, we just uh, given a glimpse of our study here. So far, we have analyzed more than hundred varieties of hawkers and identify parameters and patterns in relationship to that. The mutual relationship among them are not hierarchical, uh, rather rhizometric, and the resultant organization is about the intensity of uh, prevailing parameters. The cosmopolitan corporate culture is threatening to upend many of our listed traders and products but we do have faith in their inherent resilience. They are indeed designers themselves. So uh, that, uh, that concludes my presentation here. Um, going back uh, to the next presentation, uh, presenter, uh, Kobir, Hasibul Kobir. Hey, could we, could we try to keep this for 12 minutes? We've got to really be a bit careful with our time. Thank you.
can you hear me? Yeah, just can we can we try and keep it to twelve minutes? We, we're really we're running over time, but long way. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I'll be talking about design with by uh, the communities. And yeah, I'll just maybe if we have time in the uh, in the question answer session, maybe maybe I can talk more. Maybe I'll just go. So I, I'm going to talk about uh, design with communities and, and uh, the communities I I mean about uh, human communities and also non-human communities. I'm an architect and landscape architect. Uh, and my practice is uh, co-creation architects. I also a part of OCA, Platform Community Action and Architecture, that is it, uh, in Bangladesh. And there is a regional network of 19 countries that is Community Architects Network. Part of, and I teach at Bragg University. And uh, when I say about uh, co uh, design with, not by or for, then it means I mean it as a co-creation. So design with mean I am meaning about co-creation. The way uh, you, you can see the top uh, photograph is in the largest uh, spontaneous settlement, uh, you could call it slum in Dhaka city. Uh, they are co-creating their spaces and also uh, uh, the nature community uh, in this water, uh, different different uh, plants and other organisms, they are creating their own community and, and they are co-creating. And when people, human beings, they uh, understand that rhythm and then the, the system, then the co-creation becomes better. That's what I'm going to so during the COVID situation, you know, this, these are the questions many people are asking, we are asking, so this is, but during this COVID situation, I think these questions became more uh, uh, visible <laughs> as, you know, what do human communities really need? What do non-human communities need? What does our planet need? And how to balance these needs? And how to make ourselves useful? Ourselves means we, uh, as a designer. So these are the two questions I, I will be asking through you know, two experiences I'll be showing. Our works, so the, the, all the works I, 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 I'll show is, is uh, uh, there are you know, not single author. Uh, how, how can we, the designers, be useful to the other 90% population of the planet? And how can we be useful to the natural environment, as I said? and how to reach them. Because, you know, the problem is, uh, I feel that in our universities and other, uh, I mean, we we somehow are directed and somehow in the practice, we are serving maybe less than, you know, 10% population of, of our country. And it's, it's, it's true in, in, in other countries, many other countries also. So uh, I'll show two, two of my experiences. Uh, one is uh, as a, a landscape architect, another one is you know, as an architect. So this is a, a design with the nature community. It's outside of Dhaka city, uh, very urban space. And uh, the, I was invited to design a retreat. Uh, uh, people will go there and uh, stay there in that type of. So there was a disturbed forest. So, uh, and the people are, it's a low budget project and, and how to do this, then how to learn from nature. Uh, so what, uh, uh, what we discovered together that when I, when I draw, then people, those who are there, they don't understand. And when they draw, I don't understand. So what we did, we, we, we uh, started to draw. I started to draw on air, some, like, like we are talking about the drawing. Then they start, the local people, those who will be in implementing the uh, project, uh, they drew on, on, on the floor. Then someone just draw it on the, 
on the board and we took photograph of that and it became their drawing and they started to implement it so this is this is a common uh, drawing uh, drawn by all and uh, we divided the uh, the responsibility you know someone took the responsibility of of water management so uh, because there are a lot of uh, water areas we, we designed together we we uh, so yeah uh, and this is actually not uh, this is outside of of that site so we learned from the uh, from the nature community and we said that, okay maybe we can copy this in our land in our uh, in our space then we went to the nearby forest uh, a more uh, original forest then we learned from the forest and told them okay we can copy this in, in our so this is very easy because one architect or one landscape architect cannot reach you know the question is that how can we reach this you know so many people in our country so this is this is the way uh, we are thinking that if we can if we can uh, uh, share the knowledge if we can learn the principles then many people can design uh, by by themselves so immediately you know this this uh, people they uh, they started to do and and my responsibility was to go there uh, and see and appreciate their work and maybe share that oh, okay in theory this is what happened and and most of the time the the, the exciting thing is that this is the forest edge and uh, in uh, after one year it became it, the forest was disturbed and many other forest uh, spaces are also disturbed so this space became overpopulated with wildlife because uh, because somehow the wildlife they got uh, they uh, maybe uh, thought that this is a uh, good area to stay water edge it is it's a designed space but but we are saying that it, it may it may look that it is there then we question about luxury, comfort, beauty, and all these things. This is very, very most visited place uh, uh, around uh, near Dhaka. So uh, many people ask. I, I, I'm going to share now, share another project, and many people ask that: How do you start? Why do they trust trust you? You know this type of project, or they will do it uh, by themselves. Then we always say that. Uh, we led the communities to be the solution. And I learned one word from uh, my studio, you know, when I asked, when we, we, we asked our teachers, ah, this is what we cannot do it. Then the teacher said, oh, it's your problem. You should solve it. So I, I tell this thing also to my, you know, so-called, you know, clients that, oh, it's your problem. You should solve it. So in that way, we start the discussion. It's not that I am not with them. So the last thing is that be present with the communities. Then let tell them that it's your problem and solve it by yourself. So next uh, project, uh, not project, I call all these things as a process. There, there is a start, but there is, there is no end of the, all, all of this uh, I mean, project. So with human communities, it's in a small uh, uh, city, then uh, you know they could get together so you know we made you know we sat with them then they, they we said that yeah, we need you need to get together save together map together all these things uh, they did it by themselves <clears throat> and we are with them they are planning their whole community they made their model and they they are saying that this is how incrementally they, they will be building their houses then uh, she's an architect uh, and she is showing that the, how they can, you know, one of the options that we, we, within that budget. So, you know, architects can can help to visualize their their dreams better. Then they uh, then they implement their uh, project uh, by themselves. And uh, you know, they say that a community architects. We, we, I call our, myself as a community architect. They said the community architects gave us courage to build build it by ourselves. 
then it's very important to learn about the financial model. Model. If we cannot you know, fix this, then it will not sustain. So all the money from outside or, uh, or their savings, it, it goes to a central uh, community fund, then they distribute it and they take the decision. And, uh, and, and how to scale it up. Then uh, they, you know, in the beginning they did in five communities. Now they are extended it to, to the 63 communities and they have a, you know, network in all. And this is how you can scale it up. We are now doing it in, in Dhaka city, the similar process we are taking in Dhaka city, you know, mega city. And then the question is, uh, we ask that if, uh, uh, if the community people can do their, uh, I mean, build their community, why can't the city people build their city? So we, uh, in, in our city, Jinaida city, we sat together, all groups, all different groups, many, many different groups, more than 20 different groups. We sat together and, you know, started to design our city together. Then, then when needed, we invited planners and, and others. And with the with the city corporation, with the mayor. Uh, this is another another map we are doing in a different way, model maps, and then we are we, different people. People share their their things. It's not the architects they are sharing. People, all the vendors and others, they are sharing that they are going to uh, visualize their city in this way. And sometimes, you know, with the help of architects, uh, some of the uh, some of the things are being implemented. Uh, uh, by the city authority, and uh, what uh, and and I I think that this is this can be also learned. I mean, most of the time we we cannot learn it from from uh, our education institute. So this is how we are trying in Brack University, and and this is the thing we we always emphasize that design, not design for design for is okay, important, but start with, you know, design with people. So, and we say that design with people is a learnable skill. It's not that, oh, okay, you go some, you can learn it in the university. Like here, uh, the students, they go to the community, the community people, they are invited to the university and uh, also city authorities or, or the leaders, uh, they are invited to, you see the in, in the right hand side, uh, the bottom, photograph the community you know the, the clients are sitting there in the in the jury in the final presentation and uh, the one of the community uh, member he is uh, defending the the students or explaining the project so this is how they the students get confidence to uh, to work and in the end i will say how to scale it up the scale it up in, the, in not in a conventional way we need to find out a system. We need to find out a, 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 a search, a, a network. That network maybe exists in, in spontaneous settlement, uh, in human communities, or, or in, 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 in a nature community. Uh, so so in, in the scale up, if I say that in the left-hand side, the, this type of system, organizational system, maybe it's organization or academic institution, this type of system is not non it's not resilient system the right hand side it, this is the resilient system where it's, it's connect, connecting with each other slowly it's, it, that's that's co-creation network and 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 i think we, we can learn it you know i i feel i felt to share with that with you that we can we can learn from the forest spontaneous communities and also from coronavirus you know how to how to uh, scale scale it up and maybe do better for the communities or for the world thank you thank you that was that was tremendous um i, I just want to say a few words before um introducing um a couple of, of, of guests who are going to be joining us um I, and one thing i'd say was was i mean i learned so much today from your presentations i, I you know i I remember in Dessau, three of you were students of mine in Dessau, we were talking about Deleuze, but this was really the most extraordinary um, 
uh, lesson in a kind of Deleuzean perspective, I thought, you know, in a way, we we're talking about complete deterritorialization. I mean, this lack of kind of permanence, the, even the map itself is, is, is fluid and dynamic. The buildings are completely um, deterritorialized and nomadic. Um, and your concept of time is very rhizomatic, shall we say. But this was absolutely fascinating. And I, you know, I, I, I don't want to say any more. I just want to just digest some of these things. But we'll have some time for a few, uh, about 20 minutes for questions, but not, not so long. But, um, and I just want to introduce uh, uh, Marina. Um, unfortunately, Marina Tavison can't be with us for the questions, but we have our own Marina. Marina Rodriguez de Neves, um, who is a, a professor from uh, La Plata in Argentina. Uh, she's also about to start a Doctor of Design uh, degree at uh, Florida International University. And I also want to introduce um, another special guest, as, which is a this time of year. It's a kind of like a um, I know that that uh, Bangladesh is a, is a is a Muslim country. You don't celebrate Christmas, but at Christmas we. In the in the in the West, we come together, and of course, we can't come together. Um, uh, yesterday, I had a, a, a Zoom conversation with my family back in the UK. Uh, we were kind of uh, alone together, to use Sherry Turkle's term. Um, but this also, this what is nice about Zoom also, it allows us to make connections between people who've never met before. And many of the Digital Futures presentations were based on that, bringing together diverse voices and creating a sort of dialogue that wouldn't otherwise have been possible. And this is allowing us also to make this incredible journey to Bangladesh and to find out some absolutely fascinating um, comments. It was really beautiful presentations. But it also allows us, this Zoom thing, to um, to bring together guests who 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 have maybe were together and um, are no longer um, no longer together. So I want to introduce our our, our other um, um, uh, guest for the discussion. Um, Bobby, can you put your uh, uh, show yourself now? You're you're, you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Uh, hello so so just me say that Bobby was was back in Dessau. He was part of. Team Bangladesh um, with Shamana, um, we had two Team Bangladesh, and he spent much of his, his final semester um, uh, being fed uh, Bangladeshi curries, some amazing Bangladeshi curries by Shamana. So I brought uh, uh, Bobby back in to, to meet you guys today. So Bobby, welcome. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, to you and to hear you all again. It's, it's <laughs> amazing. Yeah, Neil, Neil succeeded to organize all this in a couple of days and really glad that we we, we, we managed to do this. It, it was a kind of, it, the whole thing is a body without organs. It's really kind of like a certain lack of organization, but that organization within that lack of organization. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe um, Marina, I, I want to hand over to you. I know you have a question. We've also got a question in the chat as well. Um, thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Great, great presentation. Thank you. I, I, I believe I, I agree with Neil, with Neil about what he said. And I, I think that these are today we have an important lesson for the rest of the world, what we, we, you are showing us about Bangladesh. I um, I've been studying about, uh, for example, the climate refugees that you have there. And uh, I, I think that this can help us to understand how can we learn together, how can we um, um, solve together the problems that are coming. Uh, and this idea of uh, indeterminacy, of the temporal thing, or the temporal process that uh, you were exposing in the different, different presentations, I believe that they are great to understand um, the, yes, what, what, what do we have to expect in the war uh, for example, I know that you are dealing with um, fluid problems or how the territory is changing all the time. And um, so I think this can help us in a way to rethink also the boundaries between the local and the global, which are not like these uh, two categories. And every time that we want to categorize one thing like is something local, we turn to a global thing and we know that local action has global effects. So we, we are dealing all this time with uh, this absence of categorize that uh, I think that help us to understand more the work of uh, architects in a society. So I, I believe this is like a first comment to, to my question. 
And my, my, my question is related to migration. How can you, in a way, uh, can map uh, dynamic processes? Because I could see in the different presentations that you have like a kind of, for uh, in, in a way, a cultural migration. And uh, no, so I can see like people from Bangladesh working with uh, global uh, materials, no? like, uh, I don't know, coke, uh, bottles or things or reuse and the plastic in a new way. So I can see that there is also a migration of the matter of the territory. So one day you have a, you are the owner of a piece of land and the next day, day you, you don't have anything <laughs> because of the flood. And I think this is important to, to understand uh, how we should think the future of architecture as a process more than an object, uh, because it's impossible to pretend that architecture is going to stand, no? Because it's changing all the time. And this is a, a, an enormous exchange of energy uh, at the same time, energy in terms of uh, uh, water and salt and everything. So my, my question is about migration. And what do you think, for example, about this idea that in terms of sovereignty, matter and matter migration, and even uh, the migration of the population, cannot understand about political boundaries. So, uh, for example, you have in um, Bangladesh um, that India is taking the water during the dry uh, season, so it's taking the water, but then uh, when the, you don't need the water anymore, what is the monsoon season, they open the, 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 the control of the water. So all your territory is flooding because of this. So how can you understand this migration uh, of matter that cannot be understood uh, as a, that it doesn't understand political boundaries. So it's moving up uh, through, so through the territory, and this like a kind of transboundary migration in a way. And also you have the same problem with the plants, the power plants that you have in Bangladesh now. There are like, I don't know, one is German, but is in Bangladesh and they are like killing all your environment. So that, that's my question. What do you think about uh, the, um, the sovereignty of the resources and the political boundaries that we don't have any more in a way. So that's it. Sorry for the long question. It, it was that uh, was that a question or a kind of in a way a kind of statement? I, I don't know whether whether I know, um, maybe Mitham wants to say something, but uh, 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 it's there was so much in that 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 question. Mitham, do you want to say something? Uh, uh, well, actually, I, I was waiting someone else to talk about it, uh, but um, uh, it, it's more of a, a political question, I think. Um, uh, uh, the question of, uh, uh, of a boundary, a question of an entity of, uh, uh, of a country is actually, uh, if we look at our history of Bangladesh, it is quite fluid. I mean, um, it, it was part of uh, total India once. And when we went to uh, in other countries in in, in Europe, uh, many of us actually uh, thought of money, never heard of uh, Bangladesh. They thought that we we were Indians, and uh, to some extent, it is actually true uh, um, because um, there was actually no that condition of boundary. I mean, uh, if we go from Bangladesh to India, uh, you you do not see any change. You do not see any change. Uh, in 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 terms of landscape, uh, in terms of people, in terms of language, uh, and and uh, the bound, the age line, the border line, is actually a construct, a construct uh, by uh, by uh, I, I would say for political motivation. Uh, it it is not uh, something uh, that you you will say that it, it happened naturally. It is uh, something uh, that came uh, from outside. And um, actually, uh, for for that boundary condition, uh, we can blame the British <laughs> when when they uh, left uh, this country. Uh, they divided the whole country, which was actually one country, 
into uh, into two different countries, which uh, eventually turned into a three different countries. So um, uh, the uh, question of migration, um, we I personally do not think that we are uh, a citizen of one country. Uh, I, I we actually uh, believe that we are citizen of the whole Indian subcontinent to some extent, and uh, that you can also see. Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, I, I know that you all know about the Rohingya situation right now that is happening here, uh, which is a kind of a burning situation here. Um, so, uh, so many people has come uh, from Burma to Bangladesh, and um, uh, and if you go there to talk about those uh, persons, those Rohingya uh, community people uh, who who came here from Burma to Myanmar. Uh, from Myanmar to Bangladesh, from another country. Uh, but uh, if you uh, talk with them, if you just uh, see them, you will know you will not see any difference. Uh, they are actually the same people uh, that uh, we we uh, meet anywhere in Bangladesh. Um, and in fact, um, I have seen um, some people in in my house um, whom I didn't know that he actually came from. Uh, Myanmar, uh, in, in this Rohingya situation, he, he, he actually uh, came back, uh, came to the center of uh, the Dhaka city. So, uh, so uh, I, I do not know how to answer this thing. I mean, uh, with the immigration, uh, the global, uh, the global pat platform, or uh, the uh, the political uh, boundary of uh, states or, or countries, um, are actually uh, quite in question. Um, in, in our cases, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, suppose um, uh, when we go outside, the question of uh, question of immigration, question of boundary, um, uh, haunts us. Haunts us because um, if if I want to go to uh, go to Europe, uh, I have to go through so much um, checking and uh, so much clarification um, that uh, in in that time. Um, it, it seems like that the globe wants us to be local. Like the globe wants us to to uh, get bogged down within that boundary area. Uh, but uh, as you have seen, um, uh, uh, the presentations from here, um, the, uh, the many presentations were um, talking about the local. At the same time, uh, the architectures, the works uh, that uh, that uh, uh, that we have seen. Um, are actually taking uh, a kind of global um, yeah, global visual also. Uh, so uh, where does this uh, get uh, get mixed? I, I am actually in in a kind of a pursuit of uh, knowing that. I, I guess um, if uh, Kobir Bhai wants to say something, uh, it would be very interesting. Kobir Bhai. No, I, I think <coughs> he, there are what he said, uh, it's okay. But another thing is that, I, uh, that there is also migration internally uh, within the country. And, uh, uh, and uh, the, the Rohingya situation. And the Rohingya situation is completely political, but in 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 country migration, that is also very uh, like from the flood and other other uh, natural hazards. And those things, uh, and one way we we have been trying to work that is <clears throat> to know their situation, and also make the uh, uh, information available, not by by the uh, politicians or or the policymakers, but by the people. Like for example, that's that's the thing you also mentioned the mapping. So we think that mapping is very important. It's not not mapping mapping by the professionals. Yeah, that's important. But that more important is by the people, those who are there. Maybe maybe before flood where they were there and after and it it, ha it happens that after flood they they uh, they can identify their places 
so if if people can map their their places and their you know, all all types of mapping then many uh, conflicts uh, we, we can avoid many conflicts so those are the things you know we 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 are uh, we always uh, try to see when we uh, work with this type of uh, you know transient people yeah can i just mention that, that we had a session over the um over the summer in digital futures world uh, about national borders and there was one particular presentation by paulina ochoa espejo on her she has a book called on borders and she makes precisely this point basically that you no know, here in the states especially with this current president where borders have become a hugely political issue but she was saying that there's they, they, they're kind of almost meaningless constructs in terms of the natural uh, uh, ecology itself. Um, I, I thought we've, we've learned an incredible lesson about borders today. I, I just want to bring Bobby in to get, try and get a question from him. We also have a question in the, um, in the chat here. Um, Bobby, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, we are all using these different platforms lately, so different setups and we have to, we have to, to deal with, uh, with the, with the with, with all of them. Uh, well, uh, hello from me again. Uh, I'm really glad that I'm, I'm here tonight and to see a really familiar faces, not just Neil, but my dear friends from Bangladesh. Well, uh, just just to be to, to be short, thank you for all the beautiful presentations that we have today. Uh, and I would not uh, discuss in depth about Bangladesh because the, 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 the greatness and the complexity that the country of Bangladesh is having, I'm I know only just I'm aware just a, uh, a bit about the country and all, all that I've learned is actually uh, through the experience I, I have uh, living with four of my Bangladeshi friends for almost two years in Germany. So it was completely out of place. Uh, we were not in Bangladesh, we were not in Macedonia where I'm coming from, but in Germany, in a small town in Germany. So uh, I learned a lot about, about the country, although I never went there, unfortunately yet, hopefully will, will happen. But uh, what I've learned about is that uh, improvisation is a great deal of uh, living in Bangladesh. And I'm not saying improvisation in, in bad terms because uh, we have to be aware that is, uh, as I remember, a country of 160 million people, or maybe I'm wrong, uh, enormously big country, a lot of poverty, a lot of complex cultural and political relationship uh, with India, first of all, of course. Uh, and then uh, you have to improvise when you have 160 million people with a neighbor which have a border, a huge border, which is having 1 billion people. And culturally, culturally having this kind of, uh, um, let's say, deep, uh, deep connections. So uh, uh, in a way, if we make a parallel, uh, modernity was much about differentiating and contrasting things. So in terms of local and global, Shumana mentioned something about that, nature versus urbanity lately, but what improvisation is basically uh, teaches us in terms of Bangladesh, Bangladesh experience is uh, about the uh, balancing. So uh, balancing is, is a really, uh, really important uh, word as a concept. Neil, I think that you wrote, uh, wrote something about undetermination uh, in, the, in the chat. So basically the concept of uh, being undeterminated, it's actually, it works in a, uh, within the field of, of, of balancing things. So what Bangladesh could teach us is actually balancing the differences, which is, in my opinion, a, 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 a long-weighted concept that uh, uh, makes this uh, radical shift uh, in society that we are basically uh, uh, living in in the last couple of couple of decades. So basically, uh, why why it's important the balancing because it embraces the differences. It embraces all this multitude, multitude that we are all facing, no matter how small countries, no matter how big countries, no matter how rich countries, as the states you mentioned, of course, you have an uh, unbelievable experience last four years in the states, you know, with the political constraints there. 
So, so balancing is amazing, amazing concept. So it's a really, uh, uh, and, and it, it comes, derives from the improvisation in a way. So it's, it's really enriching, enriching, uh, uh, enriching our, uh, let's say, approach towards the complexity of the modern living, modern living. <laughs> yes. So I, I won't, I won't go further on. I just make this statement. It's, it's I'm really uh, under impressions of seeing all of you first of all. So that's why I, I, I stop here. But we can, we can, we can discuss later on. So. So I, I think I think that that's dynamic balancing is absolutely the lesson we learned. And I've got to say, I you said learning from Bangladesh. I mean, I forget learning from Las Vegas. I've learned an awful lot today. I think it's been a terrific, terrific session. Um, I want to just bring one one question in from the chat from uh, Victoria Yuzui Babu. Uh, her comment was to Ista Shimana. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation, as did I. I. I enjoyed all of them actually. And I think the beautiful poetic thoughts you presented about nonlinear thinking decentralization of perspective and transformation regarding the relationship of the local to the global is highly important in the times we find ourselves in. We have learned from the times of chaos, like for example, the raging wildfires in California, that much of the indigenous vernacular knowledge of living with the land and elements is very important for our understanding of the intricate relationship with landscapes and how to build enclosures for human life. The embeddedness in the elements and the land over generations of local communities is very important in the creation of knowledge. Uh, in a modern classroom, uh, that is hard to convey. You showed us how to, how, how, um, how to start thinking about these matters. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how you think this embedded knowledge of land can be brought back into the profession of architecture. How can the embedded knowledge of land be brought back into the profession of architecture? That was a great question. Well, I, I think that's a, a difficult question to answer. Um, primarily, our, the holistic understanding of architecture is still so much uh, um, kind of embedded in Western thought. Um, I, I, I think I wouldn't have realized this myself unless I actually got into teaching because it's through uh, this um, experience of teaching that I find that uh, when, when I'm uh, in the classroom, there is not much that I can uh, give to my students in terms of texts or in terms of documents or research that is based on local um, uh, no, forms of knowledge or local, local wisdom. And much of the things that we are teaching are based on, of course, European texts. Um, or texts produced in the West. So personally, I think first of all, it's it's about uh, developing a holistic appreciation and understanding of the local. That's, that's I think, important, uh, an important first step. And then um, personally, what I uh, try, have tried to do is take the students out there to these localities. Like for example, I showed an example of um, a project, an urban uh, project we did for Nishara in Chitawang. And uh, we spent three semesters um, uh, back to back. And we actually went back and forth to the site. Uh, we stayed in the local community. We uh, talked to the people there. We talked to the people that were engaged in the planning process. and. Um, the students themselves kind of developed an understanding of the localities that they were working in. Um, although it was, of course, a very short time, but even then, that exposure, I think, helped them a great deal in, um, under, in kind of understanding the strength of the local communities or the strength that was embedded in the landscape and in the kind of connectivities of the different natural elements. So, I think it's um, important uh, to, of course, um, understand uh, local techniques, technologies, local wisdom. And I think even to today, even more, because we're always talking about sustainability and how um, uh, we've kind of created this havoc, unleashed this havoc through development. Um, uh, and 
I think one of the major things that I've learned studying these communities is that um, we're, we're always talking about sustainability, but we, we don't put a leash on ourselves in the way that we are living our lives. I mean, we're always um, chasing after the next products and the next um, gadgets. And I think unless we actually, as, as, a, as global citizens, we kind of see that we have to kind of cut down on our own consumptions, uh, on our own uh, kind of rethink the way we live our lives. Um, we cannot really achieve anything. So I think it's, it's, it's more of a holistic um, understanding that needs to be developed on creating habitats, on creating um, uh, a habitat that is in one in kind of um, in lieu with uh, the natural world. I I don't know if that answers. No, no. I think I mean just I would say I think that in terms of. Um material and we now have some material which i think is incredibly useful we will post this 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 discussion on our youtube channel and this has been incredibly useful for me as a kind of vehicle to discover about some of these issues i mean i teach i've got two posts one in in, in miami which is of course about to go underwater with really someone's from sea level rise also in shanghai where also we have this problem in a way and and uh, somehow what you've presented has been a really interesting kind of way of, of working with the system i mean super interesting is in terms of of the learning um, from 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 the natural world. Um, uh, I, I, do, do we have any? I, we want to wrap up now. I, do we have any final comments from Mar Marina or or, or um, from from Bobby? Uh, yeah, I have a, a, a last comment because the first one was more a statement that that a question finally, because. Um, um, I, I really believe, I'm, I'm going to repeat one thing that I said, but I, I really believe that this is a, a really important lesson for all of us. And uh, particularly to understand, first of all, this, this idea of the, ter the territorialization that uh, Neil mentioned about uh, the left theories, but also about how can we think the place where we live, considering that we are in a dynamic process, that we are part of the dynamic process. Because if we are going to build our building, thinking that because it was a really contrast, con, contrasting thing when you show it, like for example, uh, the um, uh, Lois Can uh, building of the National Assembly, you no, know, this idea like a kind of monument, you no, know, with a stone and is like designed to stay, you no, know? and then you show like the delta. No, like something that is in constant change and you, you put your house and then the, the next day, the, 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 uh, all the, the, the environment is changing. And uh, there was like reconstructing, con constructing, I think in a way, idea of, of architecture. And uh, what, what I think is like, finally, uh, Louis Kahn building is not so stay as we think it is. <laughs> because if you start to see, you are going to be like, water thing, problems and uh, I don't know, moods and things that are in the walls and then the, uh, it starts to scratch and things. So buildings that we think that are going, I am designed to stay like this kind of monuments are not as we uh, asked, uh, uh, um, they, they're not stopping the time. Maybe they have like a delay in the duration of the process of change, but <laughs> it's, it's also changing. And I think that uh, maybe uh, the, um, the, the last uh, question could be if uh, is the delta uh, noise for the Louis Kahn imaginary Im imaginary that we, you you work all the time it's like kind of noise on it it's like a kind of force of change it's just a vector that we are not seeing but it's still there it's working in our imagine architectural imaginary so that was my my last question <laughs> thanks. Thanks, I really appreciate the. Well, well the, we maybe we don't have an answer to ask that question. Maybe Bobby, just a final comment from you, and then we should wrap it up. Yes, uh, thank you, thank you. Neil. Well, I will just <clears throat> I will just say that uh, what we can learn about uh, with this uh, with this uh, uh, project that were shown today is not just about the social aspects of and the social value of architecture, but also which is all, uh, which is very very 
uh, important for globally. It's basically the relationship between the nature and urbanity. So because this shifting ground of nature that you are basically stuck with, with the, with the huge rivers and the meandering and completely changing the, 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 the changing the, 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 the topography of the, of the, uh, uh, of the place and basically changing the, the, uh, the, the, the way how people are living, it's actually a lesson that we can, uh, we should adopt a approach that is open-end, approach that is not finite. Uh, that, that's the, that's the uh, actually uh, very important uh, approach towards uh, dealing with things. I'm not saying fixing things, but dealing with. So it's kind of an ongoing open and open end, which, uh, it, it's, which is a very, very, very important lesson on every aspect from the social and the, uh, how to deal with the poor, uh, with the, with the uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, problems which are uh, social problems up to the up to the uh, how to under how you understand the society so uh, it's 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 amazing it's amazing thank you so okay let, yeah. let me just say just a final few words to kind of wrap things up um i mean i i learned a lot from to, uh, today really a terrific amount today but i also i think one thing i learned from uh, from being with you guys in Dessau. um and I want to give a shout out to Shetu, who's the one person who isn't here today, but uh, uh, was it, I mean, it was a lesson that came to me from working there was actually the top 2% anywhere in the world are, 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 are smart. They haven't necessarily got to have the money to be able to go to the AA or wherever, but you can find talent everywhere. And, you know, I think what today was, was, was not only, I supported that sort of view, but also it kind of gave me this kind of this view that actually we really can learn from you guys. I mean, when we talk about, parametricization and so on. I mean, you guys are dealing with parameters the whole time. And I think, you know, we talk about Deleuze. This is the most kind of Deleuze um, <clears throat> I've ever come across. We had a joke actually when uh, we were in Dessa, when, um, uh, when when Bobby was, was actually part of, we called it Team Bangladesh, and Shimano was feeding him uh, Bangladeshi curries, and he was becoming Bangladeshi. So the concept of becoming is a kind of a, it's a mutual reciprocity that goes on. The wasp becomes the orchid, the orchid becomes the wasp, and so on in Deleuze. But this was the most graphic and the most insightful presentation, set of separate presentations, but really illustrated to me that Deleuze is absolutely not dead, but what he's talking about is, is super important. And I think it's got an incredible relevance today with the kind of issue of borders, national boundaries and so on, especially in the context of the, of, of the state. So I, I just want to finish off by saying thank you so much. This was incredible, <laughs> incredible. Um, so um, let's keep in contact and uh, let's see where we can build upon this because this is really fascinating. Uh, there is no uh, center and periphery. We are all part of a kind of network and let's use this platform to try and destabilize all those kind of these these territorialized kind of demarkers that have been in, we've inherited. We need to open up to a more kind of a non-hierarchical, non-oppositional uh, way of thinking. And, and you guys have given us a fantastically graphic illustration of how we can do this. So thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, thank you all the presenters. That was fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank especially you. for your patience our time management. I, I now know about Bangladeshi concepts of time. <laughs> I, I, know. I, I, I think there, there is a very good question uh, in, the, in the Gustavo Recon. Oh. I think this is very, very important. Maybe you can see and, and ask yourself this, this very interesting question. And I think we should ask this again and again and take how we can take architecture to people uh, or, or our, uh, you know, our knowledge, because people don't know us. <laughs> people don't know us. We are, we are shouting, but people actually don't know us. Yeah. I think yeah. we got to, yes. especially that the, the elitist view that architects <laughs> have, we need to learn from, learn from people and we need to learn from this kind of the, the we, we've learned from Bangladesh today. So <laughs> let's wrap this up. But thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. This thank, nice. you. thank you. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. Now, now I need to come back to all my the last lecture after the <laughs> reading after this presentation. It was so great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're finishing, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay.
I will skip the comment then. Nice to see you, Bobby. Bobby, Bobby, just go ahead. No, no, just uh, like uh, 10 days ago, we have a lecture, Zoom lecture from James Westcott. Uh, he's a lecturer at AA, and basically he was co-curating the the last uh, MoMA exhibition of uh, OMA in uh, about um, uh, na nature. Rem Kolhas was working on nature. So actually it was, I mean, it's, uh, it was really nice lecture, but on a way, in a way it was completely different approach towards fixing things. So what, we were, what they were doing is uh, he was showing, uh, because they were asking Jeff Bezos to, to buy enormous amount of land in South America in order to preserve it, because there is a, there is a, uh, you know, it's completely top down. So uh, you're going to buy land and then you're going to preserve it. So, and what we have learned today from Bangladesh is basically that you, you don't need to buy land, you need to manage, you need yeah. to manage things. So it's, it's completely, uh, completely different uh, seeing of things. So it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, just, it, it, it uh, inspired me. That's why I have to comment it. So it's not top down, it's vice versa. It's, it's, up. it's, yeah. it's life, life lesson of the week, as, 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 as Neil was saying. So it's. It inspired us all. Okay, guys. Yes. The great last comment. What is this? What is this? <laughs> okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah, thank you, everyone.